Hi and welcome to the Open Tech Lab. In today's video I want to do a bit of firmware reverse engineering and I'm going to be retreading a bit of old ground because as you might have noticed if you've been watching this channel for a while I have a long running interest in HDMI capture devices which is something I need to do quite often to produce videos on the channel. So previously I've done two videos uh, about these two devices doing full teardowns and reviews. This is an LKV 373A HDMI extender device and this gets paired up with a similar looking device that receives a signal through uh, an ethernet cable so that you can send HDMI signals long distances. And then I also did a review about this device here which I've got the lid off. Uh, this is an EasyCap 283S uh, which is used for capturing HDMI video and recording it into an SD card or sending it into a uh, PC through USB. So both dissimilar devices but as it turns turns out they actually share the same media processor at their core which is the ITE 9919. Now there's quite a lot of mystery around this processor, uh, there's very little pu public information put out by the manufacturer and so a lot of what is known is uh, based on leaked data sheets and information that's been gleaned. But there's quite a lot of interest in knowing more about these devices and hacking on them because uh, they both uh, devices like this have quite a lot of useful features and uh, quite a bit of potential that could be unlocked uh, with the right firmware installed inside them. Uh, so there is a small a group of people I've encountered mostly through Dan Man's blog. He, uh, he wrote the original blog post that inspired me to make the video about this uh, where people have been digging into how this device actually works. And so in this video I want to do a little bit of digging myself to see if I can add some new information to help open up what this uh, system on chip is all about. Now as we come back to the Lenkeng HDMI transmitter it's worth having another quick look at the main board because of course in my previous video on this device I was exploring whether it's possible to repurpose this for the purposes of capturing HDMI uh, signaling and capture it into H.264 on a PC and it turns out that indeed this is possible. And I did a teardown of the device and I was curious about these two uh, chips on the board. But because of the marking at the time I thought the, that they must just be some custom ASICs made by Lenkeng. But we now know that both these chips are made by ITE despite the anonymous marking and we now of course know that this is the ITE 9919 which is a chip specifically designed for capturing HDMI and encoding it in H.264. Now the leaked data sheet for the ITE 9910 contains a little bit of general information about the uh, chip series and what its features are. It has a uh, high level overview of features, uh, some descriptions of different blocks and it has this uh, handy dandy block diagram here uh, which shows you what the chip contains. And the main feature that it has is this HDMI receiver uh, and it can also receive data in various different formats. It's got an H.264 encoder and it can also do motion JPEG as well. And then it can send the data out in different formats uh, to a target device and it can, can send it out over Ethernet through this Ethernet Mac and it's got a controller for an SD card so it can send it out to an SD card and various other outputs that it can drive. And then in the center of it, it also has this 32-bit RISC CPU uh, and it has three of these cores for different purposes. Now there's no information in the data sheet about what this RISC CPU actually is and this is one of the mysteries about this chip. And beyond that, in this data sheet, we don't have much more information beyond uh, pinouts, pin assignment, well, that's useful information, but uh, nothing much more in depth about uh, how to program that RISC CPU or uh, register values, how to configure uh, the device. So although this uh, data sheet is good to have, uh, we're still only so far in our understanding of what the, uh, the chip does from this information. Now one of the most exciting new developments here to me is this uh, wiki which this guy Velociraptor has started and he's done a bunch of research which he's reported through this wiki and in a series of blog posts where he's uncovered a lot of him hidden information about how the Lenkeng HDMI transmitter actually works and as you can look through here he's done a bunch of reverse engineering to uncover the structure of the firmware files and also done a lot of work in trying to figure out more about how this CPU core inside 
uh, the, the uh, SOC actually works. And it turns out that the CPU core is nothing at all common, not MIPS, ARM or anything like that. It seems like this is an ITE custom processor uh, of some kind, it's uh, nothing particularly common. And he's had some success in actually trying to figure out how the instruction set architecture actually works and decoding how that, uh, how that works out. And a lot of the opcodes are still unknown, but it's still pretty impressive that he managed to get as far as he did in uh, figuring out the architecture. And he's even written a, a, some code for a disassembler as well, so you can decode the binary. Uh, they, he's also made some very exciting progress figuring out the structure of the firmware file and uh, it's broken into a series of records and uh, within that are these blobs uh, called S-media blobs and within those there are these uh, compressed sections called SMAS and these SMAS sections appear to contain uh, the actual machine code but unfortunately because it's compressed that's also scrambled it up and this compression format is also an unknown. So I think the guy's purpose in doing all this reverse engineering is to try and figure out if he can find uh, the decompression algorithm in the machine code of the device so that this SMAS format can be uh, uncovered and from that it would give someone complete control over the structure of the firmware uh, to understand it in a lot more detail. So my project here is to try and add more information if I can to uh, further these reverse engineering efforts. Now given that I know that the media processor inside the Lenkeng device is exactly the same as the processor inside the EasyCap 283S, I was curious to see how much similarity there is between the firmware files. And so I downloaded the firmware for this device, the upgrade file from the EasyCap website, uh, for this device and every other similar product that they advertise on their website. So looking at the contents of these firmware packages revealed some interesting things. So all of these packages I found have this jedi.img file inside them. And I think jedi is the code word name of the system on chip from ITE. And that name would come from their software development kit. And then doing a cursory inspection of the contents of these files revealed some interesting similarities for the information from the LKV wiki. So we have these S media tags which are present in the Lenkeng firmware files and we also have the SMAS records, uh, the compressed data sections that are also present in the Lenkeng files. So some interesting similarities are emerging. So here we are looking up close at the main board of the EasyCap uh, video capture device and here in the middle you can see under this heatsink is the system on chip, the media processor and off to the side we have this little SPI flash which contains the firmware that runs uh, that the system on chip runs off. So I'm curious to know how the contents of the SPI flash relates to the contents of those firmware upgrade files. Are the firmware upgrade files just written into the SPI flash verbatim or are they unpacked by the processor before they're written in in some way? And so is there a more complicated structure uh, to those package files in some way? So I'd like to know more about that and I'd like to know uh, how it relates to the firmware of the Lenkeng device. Perhaps it would uh, move the public understanding forward a little bit and so that's going to be my contribution to just try and dump out the contents of this EEPROM and to do it as usual I'm going to be using all open source tools and so it's a good opportunity to have a look at what options are available to enable us to do that work. So on the software side, my tool of choice is FlashROM. Now FlashROM is an open source command line tool that's typically used to reflash the BIOS firmware in your motherboard, but it can equally well be used to drive various USB programmers for programming flash chips that are not built into your computer. Now let's have a quick look at the supported hardware page on the FlashROM wiki and as you can see as I scroll down it's got support for a large number of motherboards and then right at the bottom here there's a section tucked away for USB programmers and other programmers and most of the USB devices are covered by the FT2232 driver which drives the FTDI chips which are very very common in all kinds of different programmers and it's well worth considering buying a few of these FT2232 boards because of course they have 
built-in support for serial communication, SPI, JTAG, all kinds of different methods of communication built right into the chip. And you can pick these boards up very cheaply from AliExpress for $15 de uh, delivered, and it has all this useful functionality built right into it. A very, very handy tool to have. But there are other options as well. Uh, for example, it can talk to Linux SPI devices, which would include the expansion port on a Raspberry Pi, uh, which would be very useful as a programmer. But in this case, I want to use the Searprog driver because I'm planning to use one of these blue pill boards, which are very, very cheap STM32 boards. They have the STM32 microcontroller on them, and they are so cheap. You can get one of these for under $2. So I highly recommend buying several of these for your toolkit. Very, very useful boards to have. And so we're going to have a look at how to get this set up for the task, how we can put it into operation. And I'm going to be using this open source firmware, which is an STM32 VSER prog firmware, open source and uh, it, it comes up as a serial device and it implements the SEERPROG uh, protocol uh, which Flash ROM will talk to. So we're going to do our programming through SEERPROG through this STM32 firmware. Now if we have a look at what we find inside the package here you can see we've got some 0.1 inch header ready to solder into the board. Now the major snag with these blue pill boards is that they have a hardware issue that they all seem to ship with. And the floor comes down to this resistor, R10, uh, which on this board is a 10K resistor. And it should be a 1.5K pull-up resistor on the D plus line. And this causes some problems when it comes to communication with many USB hosts. And so in order to make this work, we're gonna have to replace this resistor. Uh, it's the one downside of these boards, and uh, if it wasn't for this problem, they would be perfect. Now, the best tool for a job like this is a tweezer soldering iron like these ones, but even without those, this is such an easy job. We can do it with a normal soldering iron, which is what I'm going to do. So first, let's clean up the soldering iron tip. Just uh, apply a big load of solder there just to get the flux from it. So now I'm going to knock off the old R10 here, and I think in this case what I'm going to do is just uh, apply a bit more solder to it just to help make thermal contact, and then just, yeah, just apply heat to both sides until it lifts right off. So now I just need to clean the pads a little bit, so I'm going to use some of this uh, solder wick. Great, that's nice and clean now. So now we're going to add a new resistor. So here I've got a little packet of 1.5K 0603 resistors. Now let's bring in that resistor. It would be easier if I had this in a vise. Isopropyl alcohol just to clean it up a bit. Ah, that looks ugly up close, but in my defense, it's really hard to solder 0603 components with a camera in the way, so don't flame me too hard in the comments. So now we need to program some firmware into this thing, which you can do through the programming header on the ends here with an ST link. You can pick up an official one from ST for about $30 or so, or you can pick up a Chinese clone for just $2 on AliExpress. It's amazingly cheap and it will do the job. Or the alternative is you can use the built-in bootloader that's built into the microcontroller to load the firmware through serial, which is what I'm gonna to do today. I just need to use one of these uh, USB serial devices. This does the serial communication at TTL 3.3 volts rather than the plus minus 12 volts that you get on a proper serial port on the back of your PC and of course that would blow up the microcontroller at those voltages. So here I have the blue pill board wired up and ready to load the firmware. I've got the power coming out from the serial device here and the TX and RX communication uh, lines wired into the correct pins. And these two jumpers have to be configured correctly to load the firmware. And the details of all those jumpers and connections are listed on the show notes if you want to do this yourself. Now it's important not to uh, have this plugged into USB at the same time. We want to be powering it off the serial device only. So here I am on the installation page of the STM32 VSER Prog project website, and I followed the initial instructions to get my environment ready to build and install the firmware. So over here, you can see I've got the uh, repository checked out on my local disk and all the sub modules are set up. 
And now we can go ahead and build the firmware uh, using make with the board environment variable set to STM32 blue pill, which is of course the target. And if we run that, as you can see, it takes a couple of seconds. And at the end of it, we get this .hex file, which is the firmware file I'm interested in. It's what we're gonna load into the board. Now, if you're working with serial ports a lot, I highly recommend adding yourself to the dial-out group because on Ubuntu, at least, this is the uh, user group that all serial port devices get added to. And if you're not in that group, then it's slightly more less convenient to uh, use these devices. Uh, you need to run your commands as sudo and it's a bit ugly and it's a bit unsafe and it's a little bit inconvenient. So if you add yourself to the dial-out group, you can go ahead and use stm32 flash to load in the firmware. So now we're ready to go. We've got STM32 flash command ready with the hex file and the path to my serial device. So let's go ahead and run that. And you can see the firmware is loading in and we're done. Now I've reset the jumpers on the blue pill board and I have us watching the output of D message and LS USB here. So if I plug the device into my PC, you can see it pops up in the kernel message log as TTY ACM0, which means it's coming up as a serial port through USB. And you can see it comes up with this uh, USB device ID. Now we're almost ready to go here. So I've got the blue pill wired up to a set of these SOIC 8 grabbers. And you can pick these up very inexpensively on AliExpress. They cost about $3. And they have a set of eight little contacts on the end which will clip around the little pins on our flash chip on the board. So now we're ready to go ahead and download that firmware. So we've got flash ROM all set up and installed. I've got the programmer flag set up to point at the blue pill device at TTYACM0. And we're gonna read the output file into easycap.bin. So let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. So it takes a couple of seconds to get started. It's detected the flash chip. That's a good start. And then we have to wait a few seconds while it reads out the flash and we're done. Now, reading a flash chip in circuit like this is really rather a dodgy thing to be doing. And if you're thinking of doing it, there are several key pitfalls that you may run into that may prevent you from reading the flash chip or even destroy the flash chip, your programmer, or even destroy the whole board itself. One issue is about power, because of course we need to power up the flash chip in order to communicate with it. But if we do that, are we then powering up every other device that runs off the same power rail? We probably are. Will that cause problems for the device? Maybe. And if we do that, will it end up drawing too much current out of the blue pill uh, beyond what the blue pill can supply and causing it to brown out? And if we are supplying all that power, are we then interfering with the device's normal operation? And will it try to communicate down the uh, communication bus with the flash chip while we're trying to read from it? Now, an alternative, of course, is to power up the device in the normal way through its main power supply. But of course, we still have the problem of what if the device is trying to communicate through the SPI bus at the same time? Another problem we might encounter is that we're trying to attach to the SPI bus of the flash chip. But of course this bus connects through to the microcontroller. And in so doing, are we then fighting against the microcontroller, shorting it out as we try and drive conflicting voltages onto that SPI bus while the microcontroller tries to use it? Now, in the case of the easy cap, we can get away with it because down the edge here, you can see that all the data lines, uh, chip select, mozzie, MISO, and clock, have a series of resistors uh, in series between the flash chip and the microcontroller. And so in this way, if we attach onto the legs of the flash chip itself, we don't end up causing damage to the microcontroller shorting it because these resistors are in the way. And that's why we can get away with reading this device without having a, a tug of war between us and the microcontroller because our drive strength driving directly onto these pins with no series resistance is much, much stronger. Finally, and maybe most important of all, we must make sure the voltage of our programmer is compatible with the voltage of the flash chip. So looking here at the data sheet, you can see our wind-bombed SPI flash is compatible with the blue pill because both of them run at three volts. This can accept any voltage between 2.7 and 3.6 volts so the two of them are perfectly compatible with each other but if the flash chip ran at a different voltage for example 1.8 volts you definitely wouldn't want to connect it to a 3.3 volt blue pill uh, it could well blow it up and in that case you need to wire it in with level translators you can get a level translator board like this one that will translate to the lower voltage 
So now let's have a look at what we captured out of the flash chip. And as you can see, I've got here a hex dump of the first few bytes of the contents. And we start off straight away with one of those S Media 02 tags, which I was discussing earlier. And we have some very familiar, interesting looking data. We've got the IT tech uh, string here. And then down here, we have one of these SMAS sections, which is presumably filled with compressed data. Now, if we have a look at a comparison between the file we captured and the file we downloaded from the EasyCat website in a side-by-side -side diff, I found something rather interesting because it turns out that the first 16 bytes of the upgrade file seem to be unique to it. But then after that, the two files exactly match up for the entire length of the upgrade file. File. And it's only when we get beyond the length of the upgrade file that you find any difference. So it looks like the upgrade file is just being written into the EasyCat flash chip verbatim. And then we have a lot of uh, ones going down, a whole load of ones. And then down here, a little way after our data area, we seem to have um, some random data. So I don't know if this is configuration storage or if this is just some junk data hanging around from an earlier version of the firmware. So what have we learned here? Well, not much other than it, the data is being transferred from the upgrade straight into the flash chip. So I don't know if that counts as an interesting discovery or not. So once again, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with these little blue pill boards. I always have a good time using them. They're so incredibly inexpensive, and yet there's a large number of open source firmwares ready to use straight away, not just the flash chip reader, but programmers for many other microcontrollers out there. You can also program it as an Arduino, which is very useful. And if you want to program it with bare metal firmware, you can use the libopencm3 library, which is an absolute pleasure to use. So all in all, I always have a positive experience when dealing with these boards very very happy with the outcome. Now the next obvious thing to try is to try reading the firmware in these two flash chips on the Lenkeng device and I'm not the first person to do this and I wondered if I could do it with my setup but unfortunately I've had no success doing it and the problem appears to be related to a problem I mentioned earlier which is there are no series resistors on this board and therefore when we try and drive signals onto the SBI bus pins of the legs of these flash chips we're driving directly against the IT microcontrollers. And so in that way, it's not possible to get a clear signal through, um, through the blue pill board to actually read the firmware out. Now, based on what we know already, I don't think there's very much doubt about what we find in these two flash chips from my own discoveries and other people's research. It looks pretty clear that it's going to be a verbatim copy of one of the upgrade files written into the memory. So I don't think there's ever so much value in just reading the chips as it is, because it'll just tell us something we already know. So I've been trying a little bit of a different tack. Now, someone discovered that this little pin here uh, connects to a serial output debug port that's connected through to this little ITE HDMI capture chip. So I've been attaching this to a serial device to see if I can see anything interesting. So it turns out the board rate that this thing communicates at is 115200 board, which is completely standard. So I've got a command here to set us watching the output of the serial port. And if I turn the device on in a second or two, we'll get a bit of a spew coming out of the device. And we have some interesting text being produced. Now, if we have a look back at the spew, you can see that we get a whole bunch of text right from the get go, which is pretty unintelligible to us, although presumably it meant something to the original developers. But there's some interesting looking bits of information in here that we might be able to make some head or tail of. Now what I found particularly interesting is when we start comparing this text to the contents of the upgrade file. And within one of the SMAS records of one of the Lenkeng upgrade files, there is this section that contains a whole load of garbled up data that seems to have a resemblance to some strings. And so I think that what's happened here is that within the, uh, within the program that's running on the device, within the firmware, all the strings have been put together in one place by the compiler uh, in a read-only data section, row data section as they're called. And all the strings are here, um, uh, but they've been gobbled up by the SMAS compression algorithm. And looking here, you can see the text update, which is very closely related to what you see here. And we can also see memaddr uh, here and a bracket and then some unprintable characters. So obviously this SMAS compression format has a way of representing literal data within the compressed data that it has overall. 
Now, I found a really helpful link to this Russian forum where a couple of guys last year were tossing around some ideas about how this SMAS compression scheme might actually work. And I don't think they got completely to the bottom of what's going on, but they made a couple of very interesting observations. So, for example, one thing they spotted was that when you get these literal sections, they seem to be preceded by a specific binary code. So, for example, update is five characters in length, and it seems to be preceded by by FD, which is six binary ones in a row, followed by two zeros. And similarly, MemADDR is eight characters, and it seems to be preceded by FF, which is eight binary ones in a row. And this seems to hold true for six, seven, and eight character runs, and it might hold true for other lengths as well. Now, for the rest of these unprintable characters, if this is a compression scheme, then presumably it's using a shorthand way of representing these bits of data. And it seems to be using a back referencing scheme uh, similar to LZSS, if you're familiar with it. The way it works is that as the decompressor goes along, uh, it decompresses data into memory. And then the compressed data contains some shorthand binary codes for certain sequences that repeat themselves over and over. So it can reference some code that's already loaded in memory and in a shorthand way to reduce repetition. Now, what does this probably decompress to? Well, Probably this is using printf format, which is ubiquitous in C programming, of course. So when we see the output OX34, update OX340 in the serial port, it's probably being driven by a string update OX% %x, which is the printf format. And that's probably what this decompresses to, and similarly with the memADDR string. So what we're seeing here may well be in these unprintable uh, bytes is probably a shorthand way of representing this OX percent XX um, because we have at least two copies of it, so it will compress it down. It doesn't seem to have actually made it shorter here really, but it's, it's just the way it works anyway. Now this is all very well to theorize about how this works, but we don't really have much visibility about how this compression scheme works really because we have no way to test things. So we have no idea of what the, de uh, the SMAS data really decompresses to in memory which would allow us to figure this out. Except that we have this very narrow window which allows us to see what these particular little byte sections here are decompressing to. Now, the question is, well, what would happen if we started modifying the data inside the flash chip of the Lenkang device? Could we then start modifying this and see if we can alter the output that we're getting? Now, if we could do that, then we could start maybe trying to figure out how these binary codes work if we start trying to twiddle bits. Now, of course, many codes will probably uh, break everything and cause the whole device to fail to start up properly. And if there are checksums involved, it may well just reject our data outright. But it would be certainly interesting to try twiddling bits and start seeing, to, uh, seeing what impact we can have on the output. And if we can get it running, then we, we may well be able to make some serious pro progress in understanding this SMAS data. Now, as I already mentioned, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to reprogram this flash chip as it is uh, because, of course, of the SPI bus problems. So my plan is to try and desolder this flash chip and mount it up on this tiny little SOIC mount board that I have here, and I'm gonna then reattach it to the Lenkeng device with the necessary resistors, diodes, and so on to keep that separation on the SPI bus so I can reprogram it. And if we needed to, we could go for more extensive modifications and maybe add an FPGA in uh, to do some real-time interception of communication between the IT microcontroller. Who knows what we'll do? But that's my plan, is to try and get this flash chip off the board and onto something else to one side. So all my passives are going to go onto this little piece of pad board. And then I've 3D printed one of my trademark 3D printed PCB mounting frames. And so the pad board can slot on here with these heat stakes, which I'll melt in place when I'm ready to. And then the Lenkeng device can slot onto the other side snugly, just like this. And this will keep um, the whole thing held together because otherwise it would be very delicate with tiny little wires connecting the two together. And then this will just solder on here.
So now I'm going to solder some bodge wire from the empty outline of the flash chip over to the pad board. Come in with a bit more flux again, get these all cleaned up with a bit of solder wick. One of eight, put the other seven in and see how we do. So here's the assembled rig and crucially the Lenkeng board continues to work okay even with the flash chip off to the side but I can also read and write software into the flash chip and I can also monitor the serial port at the same time. So, so far things are looking good. So I've read out the contents of the flash chip and the first thing that's obvious is that these textual bytes are stored a bit differently in this version of the firmware but nonetheless the first most obvious thing to do is to try changing some of these bytes to see if we can change what comes out of the serial ports. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's change them all to X's and see what happens. So we're ready to go with flash ROM and it takes a few seconds. There we go and now we've loaded the new firmware in there. So now let's monitor the serial port and at the same time we'll run that and then we'll power on the device and see what happens. Okay, so let's have a look back at what we captured and what I've discovered is that uh, if we go back to the beginning here and look at that update text, unfortunately these letters have not been replaced by X's. It's been set back to the way it should have been. And by the looks of things, if we go back to the beginning of the output here, it looks as if the device has noticed that I modified the contents of the flash chip and has decided to reload it. So I suppose this particular controller here has some kind of checksumming feature and it's working with the other microcontroller on the board to reload the flash data somehow. Now I've read back the contents of the flash chip into this readback.bin file and doing a checksum on all these files we can see very clearly that if we compare the readback file to the backup I made at the start you can see the flash chip now contains byte for byte exactly the image that we started with not the modified image that I tried to load into it earlier. So at this point I haven't discovered anything particularly amazing or new beyond what was already discovered by various people but I'm certainly really intrigued by this device now. I'm really getting into it and I think there's a few more experiments I'd like to try and do which I'll be covering in some upcoming videos. So I hope you're enjoying the project so far. Please leave your comments down below, especially if you can find a product that contains one of these chips or has S Media or S Maz in it somewhere. I'd be really interested to know about that. So I'm Joel Holdsworth. I hope you enjoyed the content. If you did, give it a like and subscribe. Or if you want to support the channel, I've moved my donations over to Subscribestar and you'll find links to that down below along with the show notes containing lots of background information for this video if you want to delve into anything deeper. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you next time on the Open Tech Lab.